I believe it'll work. So we started off Proverbs chapter 1, verses 1 through 7. That gave us an introduction into the book. Uh, and as it gave us the introduction into the book, it showed us um, exactly what we were, were being drawn to. And it's literally having a relationship with God. Okay, Remember, the book of Proverbs is not a list of do's and don'ts, as many teach and many show. So do me a favor, turn to Proverbs chapter 1. We're going to look at verses 8 through 19 tonight. Uh, next week we will cover uh, the woman who is wisdom, who she is, what's that all about. Very, very interesting uh, part when we get to that. Verse 8 of Proverbs chapter 1. Hear, my son, your father's instruction, and do not forsake your mother's teaching. Indeed, they are a graceful wreath to your head, an ornament about your neck. My son, if sinners entice you, do not consent or be willing. If they say, come with us, let us lie and wait for blood, let us ambush the innocent without cause, let us swallow them alive like Sheol, even whole as those who, who go down to the pit. We shall find all kinds of precious wealth. We shall fill our houses with spoil. Throw in your lot with us. We shall all have one purse. Honor among thieves, right? Yeah. Verse 15, my son, do not walk in the way with them. Keep your feet from their path. For their feet run to evil, and they hasten to shed blood. Indeed, it is useless to spread the net in the eyes of any bird. Fishermen, you understand what that's about? But they lie in wait for their own blood, and they ambush their own lives. So are the ways of everyone who gains by violence. It takes away the life of its possessors. All right, so now, let's come back to verse number 8. And in verse number 8, what I want you to see is... What the, this is the very first instruction that we're given. Okay? And I want you to notice, first of all, who's talking and then who he's talking to. He says, hear my son, your father's instruction. Now what this is, is this is God speaking directly to you. Okay? So don't get caught up in the whole, it's son, it's not daughter. Okay. My son, hear my son, hear my son, hear my daughter, your father's instruction. God is literally speaking directly to you. But now watch what's added on here. Hear your father's instruction and do not forsake what? Your mother's. your mother's teaching. So now you've got mother and father. Turn to Exodus chapter 20. This is probably a verse of scripture that really needs to be retaught. You said Exodus 20? And well, I did say Exodus 20 verse 12. Thank you. Especially in today's society. Yeah, it, does. it does. It really does. And everybody can literally see it. The respect that children have for their parents is minimal at best. And it, it's not that way when we were growing up. And if you actually, if you go back to our parents and our grandparents and, their, and so on and so forth, boy, the discipline and the direction and the guidance was stronger and better. Right? But what's... What's the difference? What has changed from them to us? The men of God have fell asleep to the word. Prayer. The men of God have fallen asleep to the word. Yes, Amen. but they, nobody prays for their kids anymore. Nobody prays over their kids. Well, I don't say nobody. Most people don't. Because children have become an issue, a problem. But now watch what it says in verse number 12. Honor your father and your mother, that your days may be prolonged in the land which the Lord God gives you. Amen. Uh -huh. Honor your father and your mother. Now, they want to throw all kinds of things on that. What does that mean, to honor your father and your mother? This is what I want you to see with the emphasis of verse 8. And watch how this connects. The emphasis is this. Gain knowledge from those who have been around the block a time or two. Mom and dad have been around this block once before. So when they say, don't go hang out at that one place, I'm telling you, 
and you go down there, you find yourself in trouble. If you would have listened to mom and dad's reproach and listened to mom and dad's instruction in the beginning, you would have never gone down there and find out, oh, it's, and now watch. Do you think it's the same as it, now as it was then? No. no. It's probably worse. Yes. Yeah. Probably yeah. worse. Yeah. So here, right off the bat, his, God's first instruction to you is you better pay attention to those who have been around the block a time or two. So here's a question that I want to pose to you. And this is something the Lord laid my, on my heart. I don't know, what, two or three weeks ago? Who is your mentor? Who is the person that is above you that teaches you? If you have no one, I am encouraging you to find someone. Find wise counsel. And we'll talk about this in Proverbs. Because wise counsel will lead you to right decisions. Right decisions are godly decisions. So what kind of wise counsel do you need? You need wise, godly counsel. Stay away from the secular society. Stay away from the world. I mean, there's books out there that will tell you how to do this, that, and the other thing. Seek wise, godly counsel. Because it is the wide, godly counsel that will direct you into the right place. So now, verse 8 is literally laying the foundation of pay attention to those who have gone before you. Verse 9. Indeed, this is really cool. Watch this. Indeed, they, the teachings, are a graceful wreath to your head and an ornament about your neck. Now, watch this. There's two things here. There's a wreath, and then there's this ornament. What are they? Well, a wreath is something that is given to those who win a race. Go to Hebrews chapter 12. Go to Hebrews chapter 12, verse 1. Hebrews chapter 12, verse 1. You're good. I just appreciate you being up there. Hebrews chapter 12, verse 1. So the wreath is given to those who win a race. So back in first century times, back in Old Testament times, they would have these contests. And whoever won the contest was given a wreath that was wrapped around their head. It told them that they were the winner of the race. Okay? Hebrews chapter 12, verse 1. Therefore, since we have so great a cloud of witnesses surrounding us, let us lay aside every encumbrance and the sin which so easily entangles us. Now watch this. And let us run with endurance the race that is set before us. What's the goal line? Verse 2. Fixing our eyes on Jesus. Jesus. The author, he started it, the perfecter, he ends it, of our faith. Who for the joy set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and has sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Understand, your Christian life is a race, but it's not a sprint. It's a marathon. Amen. You, It's a slow race that you're in. But every single believer is in a race. Here's the thing. Some believers want to sit down at the starting line. I don't want to run the race. And God, that'll be okay. You can sit down there and run the race, but you're not going to receive anything at the end. Paul understood this. Go to 1 Corinthians chapter 9. 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 25. So the wreath that they received was perishable, right? 
in other words, lasts long enough, it's going to dry up and it's going to die. But watch this. But we, an imperishable. Please. Whoa. So you're trying to say that this race, we might win something, but we'll receive an <laughs> imperishable wreath? Something that doesn't go off? Something that never dies off? Now watch what Paul says. Therefore, I run in such a way as not without aim. I box in such a way as not beating the air. But I buffet my body and I make it my slave. Talking about his flesh. <clears throat> Lest possibly after I have preached to others, I myself should be disqualified. Now listen. Paul's not saying that he's going to get unsaved. He's saying that I would be disqualified from what? From being at the judgment seat of Christ and losing his rewards. We'll cover that at the very end tonight because at the end of Proverbs chapter 1, verse 20, I think, or verse 19, it's literally going to show you that picture. Okay? So now look, let's come on back to Proverbs. So we see the read. It's something that is given to somebody who wins a race. And it goes on your head. Everybody got that? All right. Now there's the ornament. The ornament is something that is given to those who have an official office and title. So an ornament is someone who's given to, who, who has an official office and title. And what it is, it goes around your neck. And the medallion's like right here. Okay? And when someone sees you, they know, oh, that's such and such and so and so, he has authority. Amen. Just like we say with police officers today. They have their badge, you know they have authority. So this, this ornament that is given to them is right here, but it says, hey, I have an office and I have a title. Revelation 3.21 tells you that Jesus is literally trying to tell you that this race that you're running isn't just for nothing. Revelation 3.21. He who overcomes to him, I will grant to sit down with me on my throne. Amen. As I overcame and sat down on my father, with my father's throne. So understand what, what is at stake here. It's all about winning the race. But it's not just receiving the prize at the end. Now... I want you to notice something, because this is important that you see this. Look at the placement of these two articles. Where's the first one? On your head. On your head. Where's the second one? Over your heart. Over your heart. What does this tell us? God is more concerned about your mind and your heart than anything else. Those are the two areas that God wants. Those are the two areas that he wants you to give up control to. Your mind and your heart. When God has control of those two things, you are literally unstoppable. Because you have given yourself completely and totally over to God. Amen. Now, but what's the connection? How do you win the wreath? How do you win that title? By giving God control of your mind and your heart. Amen. Remember what 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 16 says, for those who want to say, well, I don't know how to live the Christian life. You have the mind of Christ. You have no excuse not to live the right way. Because it's not about you anyway, right? It's about living the Word of God. Meaning the, the Word of God literally living through you. That's the key. So God is more concerned with your mind and your heart. Now watch what he said to you so far. Very first thing last week was, hey, I love you. I want a relationship with you. In this relationship that he wants to have with you, what he's saying is, hey, I need you to understand that in this life, all kinds of things are going to happen. But people have gone before you, and you can learn from their example, but I want you to give me your mind and give me your heart. Think about it. If our mind and our heart were completely and totally connected with God in all things, and we understand our identity in Christ, who we are, our mind, and our heart is to do the Father's will. My identity is found in Christ. My mind has been transformed. I understand who I am in Christ. But now my heart is His. He literally can do whatever He wants because all I want to do is the Father's will. It's exactly how Christ lived His life, right? So now what we're, what we're seeing here is this picture of how to live the Christian life, having your, your mind set on Christ, and allowing that all that you have is God's will in your life. When you live that way... What do you have? You have an obedient no. servant. But it's not, no, hear me. I need you to understand this. Because some people get stuck on that word. I don't want you to understand, I don't want you to get stuck on servant. You're more his child than you are a servant. Amen. 
you, you do things you serve because you love him. Because he first loved you. That's exactly the, what the Christian life... The Christian life is not about you being a servant and doing good works just to do good works and just to be a servant. It's literally understanding that he loves you. And that he loves them the same way. And when he loves them the same way, I want to live the way he wants me to live. That's the focus. Now look at verse 10. Because now things get real interesting. Because here he lays out this idea of, hey, there's a race, but there's a prize at the end that you can receive. Which is, some seem weird. But now watch what he says in verse 10. My son, if sinners entice you, do not consent. Now, sinners is twofold. I need you to see this because this is important. And this it lays the groundwork for the rest of Proverbs. Okay? It's twofold. Number one, when it talks about sinners, it's practically people in your life that are bent on doing things against God's will. Can this be Christians? No. Yes. Yes, yes, absolutely. So Christians can say, hey, I'm doing this thing. I like doing this thing. I'm not going to change doing this thing, even though I know it's wrong. Because it makes me feel good. You listen, if you listen or read my blog this morning, you talked about feelings. Your feelings are not from God. Your feelings are from Adam. Nobody taught a two-year-old baby how to get mad. It's just natural. Because it comes with that natural part of that person. God has emotions. Yes, you have emotions. But emotions and feelings are two different things. Okay, that's key. Now, what we see, practically speaking, is people. But now watch spiritually speaking. It's the enemy. You have an enemy that wants you to sin. And what is he going to do? He's going to entice you to come in and sin. And what, what, what is the enemy's job? It's, he, he can't keep you out of heaven because heaven's a guarantee for you, right? Huh? Steal, kill, and destroy. Steal, kill, and destroy. But why, now what? He can't take my salvation from me. He can't take heaven from me. But he, but he can take the kingdom away from you. He can take your rewards away from you. Yes, your reward. But now watch this. He can also remove you from the power that God has in your life to do Amen. right now. Yes. How does that happen? When we get our mind off of God and onto ourself, and when our hearts are about pleasing us. See the difference? No. It's literally a difference between God and us. And what God has done on the cross is he took you and he literally moved you out of the way. And now he has replaced you with Christ Jesus. Amen. And now here I am in Christ Jesus. And the enemy wants to entice me and say, no, 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 that's not who you are. Look at all the things that happened around you. Look at all these things that... Where is your identity? In Christ. In Christ. Now watch. If you live your life according to your feelings, you may say, oh, maybe I am that hurt person. Maybe I am that person that's never going to change. Maybe I am this anger. Maybe I am this unforgiveness, right? But now watch, if I'm living by faith, those feelings get set aside. That's not who I am. God has made me to be his son. I'm literally walking in Christ Jesus. That's the whole point of the Christian life. It's exactly what he's trying to tell you here. So be aware because the enemy is out there. Jesus clearly told you that you are in this life, you are going to have tribulations, you're going to have hard times. So here, we have to rely on the Holy Spirit's leading. Yes. So if I'm going to rely on the Holy Spirit's leading, what do I have to do? I have to talk to him. Every day. Every day. Go to James 4, mm -hmm. 17. You said James. James 4, 17. Back there preaching himself. <laughs> James 4 Stay. 17. Stay. Yes, sir. Stay. 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 Get that word in there. Now, watch this. This is where the word of God gets personal. So, when I say personal, I mean just between you and Him. Because some things that I'm dealing with in life, you may not have come across yet. This is, this is where a lot of Christians want to say, well, I'm in this place. You need to be in this place, too. Listen, God deals with each of us individually. Amen. Okay? And I, I love this example. Somebody comes in to a church and say they smoke cigarettes. Other people are like, 
Oh my gosh, she smokes cigarettes, you can't be a Christian, get out of here. Why? Because I stopped smoking about a lot of years ago. Oh, <laughs> what was it like <laughs> before you did? <laughs> well, uh, uh, uh. see, the hypocrisy there, Amen. right? So understand what he's saying. God is literally telling you, look, what I'm dealing with you personally in your heart, that's the thing that I want to deal with right now. Yes. God's not going to overload you with 50 million things to change all at once, Why? Because he knows you ain't going to be able to handle it. He knows it would literally blow your... What's that? James 4.17. Oh, James 4.17. He, he knows it would literally blow your mind. So what God does is he gives you one thing. And one thing leads to the, leads to the next. And so on and so forth. Ooh. Now watch what he says here. Therefore, to one, that's you, who knows the right thing to do and does not do it to him, it is sin. Now what is he saying? He's not saying, well... God has told Donald to do this thing, so I have to do with Donald. It. No. He's saying the thing that the Lord has laid on his heart to do, that's him. Now, when if God lays something on his heart to do, and he says, yeah, I'm not going to do it. Nobody's got to tell him that it's wrong. He knows in his heart that it's wrong. See, this is the pure thing about conviction, because it's not condemnation. Amen. Conviction leads you to a point of repentance. And please remember what repentance is. Repentance is, change duh, change your mind. It's, oh my gosh, that's what that means. It's okay, we're human, we're going to have those moments, mm. right? So what, what the Lord is clearly leading us to see here is that we have to understand that sinners are going to come in, they're going to try to entice. Now, does anybody think that the enemy kind of knows your buttons? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Okay. Does, do, does the enemy push your buttons? No. What do you do when he does? Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. It has to be Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. It has to be rebuke. Because if he, push the button, if he pushes the button and you respond, you're literally <coughs> acknowledging that he has power over you. Mm. And he has no authority over you whatsoever. No. Because why? Because my identity is now found in Christ. See? It's a completely different perspective. Wow. Now, how do you know the difference? Holy Spirit knows. All you need to do is ask. So if you come across something, you're like, I don't know if this is right or not. This is the one thing Christians don't do. Holy Spirit, is this right or wrong? It's seriously that easy. And he'll tell you. That's not right. Or he'll say, he will let you know. He will definitely let you know. Now, I need you to hear this. If you're this. paying attention, he will let you go. And I need you to hear this because this is key. Because a lot of people get, get stuck on this. Because they'll say, oh, he let me know. All right, boy, he laid down the law. You might not be hearing from Holy Spirit. <laughs> the Word of God tells you to test the spirits. Yes. Because if you, you ask and you get a harsh rebuke in, re in response, and it literally makes you feel bad, yes. chances are that ain't Holy Spirit. Because he's always gonna, he's always gonna talk to you in love. It's always gonna encourage you, and it's always gonna draw you closer to him. It's not something that's gonna push you away. That's what your parents did to you. Amen. See, that's how your parents controlled you to do what you're supposed to do. Amen. Right? Amen. If the root of it is not from the fruit of the spirit, then it's not from the spirit. That's another good way to gauge it. If the fruit that comes out is not of the spirit, now what? Who is the fruit for? Somebody else. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, faithfulness, self-control. It's all for them. It's not for you. Amen. That's why people say, I need more peace. No, you don't. You have all the peace that you need. You need to start giving it away. Sure. Once you start giving the peace away, guess what happens? I have peace. Yeah. Same thing happens when, when you give. You give, God gives to you. Amen. You know, when it talks about that fruit, it says, I ordained you to go bear fruit. That's fruit of name. But then it says... But in this commandment, I command you to love one another. So right there, it tells you that this is the fruit, and this is what you're supposed to do with it, do with it, is to love one another. So love has to come first. And who is love? Jesus. So what is God telling you? Literally, live in me. Let me live your life, and I promise you that fruit will come out. That's pretty profound. Seriously, because you, you think about it, that's all it boils down to. If I allow God to be in control of my life, I'm going to always have fruit. Because all God wants us to be is to him. That's right. That's why, he, that's why he came and walked the earth. And he wants you to do exactly. He wants you to do exactly what his son did. 
which yep. is go out there and draw people to the Father. Amen. How do you do that? On love. All right, now let's look at verses 11 and 12. If they say, so now remember who we're talking about. We're talking about literal people and the enemy. But now watch, the two can be intermingled, right? A person can be influenced by the enemy to entice you. Everybody see that? Yes. Okay. So if they say, come with us, let us lie and wait for blood. Let us ambush the innocent without cause. Let us swallow them alive like shield, even whole, as those who go down to the pit. Now, here is an invitation from the evil one to go to a place that is not where God wants you to go. Jesus will give you his own invitation. Ready? Go love this. Go to Matthew 4. Matthew 4, verse 19. Two places I want to look. Jesus gives his own invitation to you. See, what you'll notice in the book of Proverbs is the enemy is going to tell you one thing, but God has a completely different standard. Mm -hmm. Remember, walk in the spirit and you will not carry off the desires in the thoughts. Matthew 4, Matthew 4, 19. <coughs> Matthew 4, 19. So Miss Trisha already gave us this passage? Yep. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> she's reading the head, Pastor. Well, you know, she's a good question. She's here. And verse 19. <laughs> verse 19. And he said to them, now watch this. Do what? Follow me. Follow me. No, 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 no. Stop there just for a second. Look at follow me. Think about what it means to follow. <laughs> Don't get out ahead of me and start building stuff. Just follow me. You don't have to keep all the rules, regulations that they tell you to keep. Just follow me. And then what? who makes you fishers of men? Jesus. I will. Jesus will make you fishers of men. You don't got to work at it. He'll literally teach you. We're, we're, we are, we are, we are, we are going to have a, ch a child's music school in this place, right? These kids are going to come in, but they're going to be taught by somebody. Because when the kids come in, then they have no idea how to play an instrument. Amen. But Mr. Rod, as he begins to teach them, he will teach them how to play the instrument. For what purpose? God's glory. For, for God's glory, right? Because each child will have an anointing that comes in here. That anointing that he has, he will pass down. Go figure. That's how it works, right? So he passes his anointing. That anointing gets passed down and passed around. It's the same thing with your life. Amen. The very same thing, very same concept. So Jesus says, but you have to follow me. Now watch. Follow me, not the world. Amen. Amen. Follow me. Amen. Not what it says on the TV. No. Follow me. Not what they're doing at m, &M Don't even. I can't even go there right now. <laughs> Matthew 16, apparently m ms will not be the people anymore because their shoes talk about how they're gender something. Gender oh, no. Gender's everywhere. Gender and listen, if you seriously don't think that there are evil spirits that are in control of this world, you are gravely mistaken. Because they're everywhere. They're everywhere. <laughs> yeah, no, no. Why would they do that? Because that would eliminate them, right? Matthew 16, 24. All right, here we go. This is key. Now watch. I have those four. 16. Matthew 16, 24. verse 24. She's like, it's up on the screen. It should be. It is. Uh, yeah. <laughs> it is. I'm up here taking notes. I gotta get that. We forgive place. you. Yes, we forgive you. Then Jesus said to his disciples, now watch this. If anyone wishes to come after me, let him do what first? Deny himself. Watch this. you got to get rid of all of your selfish ambition. All your self-centeredness. All the things that please you and make you happy. Oh, but I do this thing because it makes me feel good. Yep, because you're supposed to live by feelings and not by faith. Oops. Man, that's not right. Right? Deny yourself. That's, that's key. Deny yourself. Take up his cross and do what? Follow me. Well, he's up, she's up here. Okay. She's okay. Take up your cross and follow me. For whoever wishes to save his life. 
that is the Greek word suke, which means soul, shall lose it. But whoever loses his soul for my sake shall find it. For what will a man be profited if he gains the whole world and forfeits his soul? Comma, at the judgment seat of Christ, parentheses. Or what will a man give in exchange for his soul? Now remember what your soul is, right? It's the seat of your mind, your will, and your emotions. If your mind, your will, and your emotions are bent on what the flesh wants to do, you will literally walk contrary to who you are. So now watch what we're seeing here. Jesus now gives his own invitation. Look at the, look at the turnaround. Because the, you really think the enemy is going to stop messing with you? You think he's going to say, man, she's just said no to me three times and I'm just going to have to leave her alone for a little while. He's going to keep coming after you. And only unless you're associated in, in the word of God and allowing God to live through you. Will that come, come to pass? Now let's go back to Proverbs chapter 1, verse 13 and 14. Proverbs 1, verses 13 through 14. So, now watch what, they, watch what they want to entice you with. Number one, we shall find all kinds of precious what? Well, mm, there it is. The love of money is the root of all evil. People chase after money like it's the most important thing in their life. And when you put money as the most important thing in your life, you're literally saying, money is my God. Because God is not my God. Because money is my God. Because God can't help me, but my money can. Huh. Turn that it's not, no, it's not true. But a lot of people, unfortunately, fall into... Now, watch this. Is it anything other than an attack from the enemy and they're being deceived? That's all that it is. It's just, that's all that it is. In other words, what they're, what we're, when people chase after money, they just don't have their identity in Christ right. Because they think that the money, the wealth that they have, that's what takes care of them. But if you step back and say, Father, you know everything about my family, you know everything about my finances... Yep, I may be overdrafted, I may be over budgeted right now, but you know what, Lord, I'm giving you control of everything right now. Amen. So take control. Amen. And then what does Holy Spirit come in and do? He says, all right, look, let's get rid of this. But I don't want to get rid of this. I thought you said you wanted me to be in control. <laughs> but I like this. I like doing this, but I'm telling you, you need to give it up. But he's a gentleman, he'll wait, right? Now, here's the, here's the crazy thing about that. When God gives you this solution, right? And you're like, yeah, but I don't like that answer. Okay. okay. I'll see you in a little while. Because you're going to come right back around, I promise. <laughs> am, I, am I right? You're going to come right back around to it. That's exactly right. All right. We shall fill our houses with spoil. Well, that'll be good when you pass away. <coughs> so you can give it to somebody else. Throw in your lap with us. We shall all have one purse. Do you seriously think it's going to be evenly cut? There is no honor among thieves. Come on now. Huh? Yeah, look at our government. So now watch this. The desire here is for money and greed. There are people who are trying to provide for themselves instead of allowing God to provide for them. Why? Because the way that God wants to provide with, for me, I don't like. That's all it boils down to. That's literally all it boils down to. Do you, do you think that God can provide for you? Every day. Absolutely, right? Anything and everything. So why do we, not all, just give up control over all of our finances and say, all right, Lord, do whatever you want. You want to know number one reason? Fear. You're afraid of what might happen. Oh my goodness, I might lose this, I might lose this, I might lose this. So we allow fear to drive us. Guess what fear is? Fear is a feeling. It's not an emotion, fear is a feeling. Fear tells you, oh my gosh, he's not going to take care of you. And you're literally living a lie. You're literally telling God, oh my gosh, I'm more afraid of losing that than gaining you. You see? And, and you take it all the way to your grave, man. And then when you get to the other, it, this was useless. 
uses. You gotta be careful with this. Okay? Are we trusting God to care for us? So this is where it all hits. This really hits hard. Go to Philippians 4, chapter 19. Because now when we talk about the Word of God, God's Word is either true or it's not true, right? So if Jesus says, For God so loved the world that His only begotten Son, that He gave His only begotten Son, that whoever believes in Him shall not perish but have everlasting life. So when we believe that Christ died for our sins, what are we guaranteed? Eternal life. We believe that based on faith. Right? Philippians 4.19. Now, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to tell you, I have prayed this prayer, and God has answered this prayer, and I'll tell you how it turned out here in just a second. Does Verse 19. She's always ahead, Miss Jennifer, always. She's my star pupil. <laughs> Verse 19. Now watch this. The lighthouse rules are in effect. Got it? <laughs> You're not slow. You're perfectly on time. Because there's somebody watching you go, wait, man, I hope somebody's not there yet. <laughs> For sure. Somebody got you nailed. Say lighthouse rules. It'll be crazy. It's like being in school. 419. I didn't put it up there. Huh? All right. Hey. Here we go. See if you believe this about God's word. And my God shall supply all of your what? Needs. Oh, it doesn't say wants there, does it? Nope. He shall supply all my needs according to whose riches? Oh, no, it's yours, though, isn't it? Yours in your bank account? His riches. Now, watch this. In glory, where? Christ Jesus. In Christ Jesus, where you are. So, watch this. God gave me the sermon. He gave me the word about Lighthouse Church. He says, I have given you the land. And I said, okay. What am I supposed to do with that? You're supposed to tell the congregation so that they can begin to pray. Because I have given them the land. We prayed. What did God do? The impossible. He gave us the land. Amen. And it got to certain six. Oh my gosh. Lord, what am I going to do about this? What am I going to do about this? And he brought this verse to my mind. I will give you everything that you need, Gerald. So what happened? Shortly thereafter, I had a test of faith. There was a situation where I did not have enough funds for something, and I turned around the Lord, and I said, All right, Lord, your word says that you will supply all of our needs. This is a need that we have to have. Guess what happened that day? He met the need. Won't he do it? So I, won't he do it? So what do I do? I go back into my prayer closet. God, you're so great. I love you so much. Thank you so much for taking care of me. You know what he said to me? Did you expect anything less? Oh. Amen. Pastor, here's the thing. If we want what God wants for us, then we're going to get our wants. <laughs> there it is. Come on, Mario. See? If you want what God wants, if you're mine, you're sick. You tell her. She can say it perfectly. So understand, it's not about, now watch. Look at the things that you have in your life, the things that are important to you. How much do they benefit you personally? How many of them are selfish in nature? See, now, when we put it in that perspective, hmm. See, you, you hear a lot of hmms, right? Why? Because we understand full well. But now, if our, if our focus is on what God wants, it doesn't matter. When Jesus walked around this earth, what was his bank account when he died? It's zero. zero as far as Rome was concerned, but it had riches beyond anything that anybody could possibly imagine. Jesus didn't go from town to town and say, all right, I've got to find a job first. What was his job? To do the will of the Father. He even says in his own words, hey, my food is literally to do the will of the Father. Amen. That's what sustained him. That's how we're supposed to be. Don't even worry about money anymore. Because all it's going to do is take you to a place that you don't want to be. Amen. Now watch. What some people do is they chase after, chase after, chase after, and they get it. They get this huge windfall, and they go, oh my gosh, look at all this money that I got. 
and it literally ruins their life. It ruins them. They're still sad. They're still sad. Because, number one, most people don't know how to handle that kind of money. But when they get that kind of money, where's all the focus? What am I going to do with it? Well, I can get a new car, a new house. It just look, brings more look what I did. Look what I did. See the selfishness and the self-centeredness of that? So you have to be very careful when it comes to wealth. And understand that the enemy will try everything he can to try to get you off that path. That's oh, he's going to rob you. Oh, yes, he will. Because he comes to rob, kill, and destroy. Amen. All right, coming back to Proverbs chapter 1, let's look at the next three verses. Verses 15 through 18. Big, big key here. <coughs> My son, do not walk in the way with them. Keep your feet from their path. For their feet run to evil, and they hasten to shed blood. Indeed, it is useless to spread the net in the eyes of any bird, but they lie in wait, watch this, for their own blood. They want to cause violence, they're going to get violence. That which you reap, you will that which you sow, you will reap. I always get those two for me. <laughs> they ambush their own lives, yes. So that verse is always kind of making me think because we, we're talking about believers here too, right? Mm -hmm. So walking in that way, in the way of being Jesus. But live in. Do not walk in the way. Not taking heed mm -hmm. to the warnings, mm -hmm. because they're, they're believers. They know what's right, but again, they choose what is wrong. What is wrong? But it also can be unbelievers too. It's anybody who's influenced by the enemy. So it can, it's so understand you. You have to open their perspective up to see exactly. But you're right. Out of an unbeliever and a believer. Who would you probably want to follow first? Probably a believer, because, you know, but can believers make the same... The, exactly. Can believers make the same choices as unbelievers? Absolutely. Well, see, that's what I'm talking about. You know, in, in a Christian life, you can be prone to wear a mask called counterfeit. That's true. And so, as, a, as he warns us, we wear a doll. I mean, just all kinds of clothes. Yeah. 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 But then it tells us to be aware of, of other different things, too. Yep. Yeah. Which all those things were aligning back to believers, but also yeah. not believers. That's right. So now watch what he says in verse 15. My son, do not walk in the way with them. Now watch this. Keep your feet from their path. Keep away. Keep away. That's what he's telling you. Watch this. Stay away from the things that will cause you to sin. Hebrews 12, 1, anybody? What did God just do? He just reiterated a point. So what does that mean? Whatever he's telling you is important. Very. Pay very close attention. Go to, he or go to Ephesians 4, 27. Ephesians 4, 27. So, one more time. Keep your feet from their path. Keep away. Keep away. Do not walk with them. Keep away. Now watch this. So what are we talking about? Staying away from what will cause you to sin. Meaning what? Ephesians 4, 27. Watch this. Do not give the devil an opportunity. This is probably one of the most profound statements that we see in Scripture that gets overlooked so much. Don't even consider it. Don't even let it enter your mind. Because once you do, you are literally walking right north towards the edge. Remember what James 1, 21 says? <coughs> Receive the word which is implanted. How do you know what is right and what is wrong? The word of God. Amen. Well, I don't have time to go to the Bible and look up the answer. Then ask 
Holy Spirit, I promise you, he'll tell you. If it's in a condemning tone, I promise you that's not him. That, seriously, we need to begin to talk to God more. And really, I mean, we need to be the fools that are driving down the road going, driving and talking to God. Always. Always, We're right? We're all giving the same amount of hours in a day. How can we tell God we don't have a few minutes for him? Can you imagine if we gave God 10% of our day? Um, yes. 24 hours, right? So what is that? Two hours? 2.4 hours. Do we give God 2.4 hours? He gives us 90% of the day to use. For whose glory? For his. his. And what does he want to do with that 2.4 hours? <laughs> he wants to take a second read. No, he wants you to talk to him. He wants you to grow close to him. He wants to build the, the love relationship. That's what it's all about, folks. It, God is not up there going, you're going to follow my rules or else I'm going to pump you on the head. No, but at the same time, he shares things. <laughs> when, you, when you talk to him, he shares things. And if you really, really loved him, why wouldn't you go investigate what he's sharing with you? Exactly. So, the case in point. It's with joy. When it talks about God providing all of your needs, once you grab onto that truth in faith, you are unmovable. Because you know that God will provide everything that you need. And you will soon come to find the things that you want. Which is something else that the Holy Spirit does for you. So now watch this. The key to keeping away is this. Know your triggers. Identify them. And do whatever is necessary to stay away from them. Let me give you an example. If someone is an alcoholic, would it be the best decision for them to go into a bar or a party where they serve alcohol? Why? The temptation, the temptation is there. Oh, you look, everybody's having such a good time. You want just one drink. One leads to another, leads to another, leads to another. Listen, the person who, who is dealing with that, first, of all, first and foremost, they don't understand their identity in Christ. They are trying to find their worth in a bottle. My worth is not in a bottle. My worth is in God. That bottle may make me feel good for a little while, but man, if I have too much of that bottle, I'm not going to be feeling very good the next morning. Can I get a witness? Amen. Okay? I'm not the only one, right? Yeah. Okay. So understand what we're seeing here. Here's another one. If someone struggles with pornography, is the best thing to do to probably stay away from those kind of sites, right? Yes. Yeah. Why? Because it's a trigger for them. If you know that something may be a trigger for you, stay away from it. If you know that somebody's going to do something and you know, if I go to this place and they're going to be doing this thing, and I know if they're doing this thing, it may cause me to stumble. I, it's best that I not just not go there. <coughs> oh my gosh, but you're not going to be the who's who of today because you didn't go hang out with such and such and so and so. And so. But I will be a servant of God who understands his identity and I know that I don't need to go over there. Amen. Because those people aren't going to stand before me in the judgment seat of Christ and say, well done, good and faithful servant. <laughs> hmm. See, this is the connection. You have to know your triggers. If you Now watch. Some people know their triggers, but then they try to ignore them. How does that work out? It just keeps coming back. And then what do you find yourself doing? Bang your head against the wall over and over and over again. All right? Now watch. But how do we do this? How do we stay away from those things? How do we know our triggers? Right. The answer literally comes in a hidden message. Come back. Keep your feet from their what? Okay. Keep your feet from whose path? So what path should you be on? God's, God's path. Right the, narrow. the narrow path. Right? Mm -hmm. You know what a narrow path is in Scripture? Mm -hmm. It's a path where only one person can be on it at a time. What did Jesus say? Follow me. I wonder why he said that. Because he's the one who knows the path. And you're in hell. And he's lost. <laughs> You know, that's why there's a highway to hell and a stairway to heaven. That's good. <laughs> Four lanes crowded. No, we don't want it to be that way. Amen? Amen. Now, go to Psalm 25. This is really cool. I like this. Psalm 25, verse 4. This is one of my favorite scriptures. Psalm, Psalm, Psalm 25, verse 4. So God's instruction is, stay away from the evil path. There's a road that leads to destruction. 
Now, what people have been told is that this, that road that leads to destruction is for unbelievers. Nope, that's for believers. Huh? How can believers be led to destruction? Because we'll see at the very, very end. That's exactly right. <laughs> when you live according to your own selfish desires, it will literally lead you to a path of destruction. Now, watch this. Make me know what? Your ways. Make me know your ways, not their ways. I don't want to follow their ways. Make me know your ways, O oh Lord. Teach me your, your path. path. Lead me in Thy your path. truth and teach me. So what does that imply? That implies that God wants to teach you. Yes. That literally means they sit there going, I want to teach you, I want to teach you, I want to teach you. I would love to teach you right now. With a smile on his face. Not, I want to teach you, I want to teach you, I want to teach you. I would love to teach you right now. For you are the God of my salvation. Amen? Amen. For you I wait. How long? All day. All day long. Every day I wait. Something else that the enemy wants to take away from you is your time. I don't have enough time in my day to do this, 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 and this. Huh. Maybe I'll fit God in here. That's unfortunately what a lot of people do with their time. They say, I've got bills, did, 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 and God can have this. Should be the other way around, right? God gets this, then I'll do this with, I'll steward this with what God gives me left, right? Psalm 119, 105. Turn over there. Psalm 119, 105. How do I stay away from their path? Let God teach you. Amen. Let him teach you your ways. Well, what are his ways? I'm so glad that you asked. Psalm 119, 105. I'm not even there yet. My name's rules. Oh, yes. See, see what I'm saying? Oh, yes. Watch how this all comes together. This is great stuff. I love God so much. Your God. word is what? A lamp to my feet and a light, what? To my path. But wait, now watch this. Whose path is it? My path. So what path am I on if I'm following Jesus? His path. You think he knows where he's going? Guaranteed. What did Jesus say about his sheep? My sheep hear my voice. And know me. And they know me. Wait. She black. Wait. Wait, what did he say? My, my sheep know my voice and they what? Know me. Doesn't it say they go to church? No. no. They, they follow rules? No. no. They know me. Here's the key. Your relationship with Christ is about you knowing him. It's not about you performing for him. My sheep know my voice and they know know me. Amen. Where he goes, we follow because we know him. Yes. Look, I'm not following somebody I don't trust. Would you? If there's somebody in your life, you're like, mm, questionable motives right now. Are you seriously going to follow them unconditionally wherever they go? Probably not. But if you are following someone you are completely and totally and madly in love with, and who loves you the same way, but even more so, by like bajillions, you're going to follow him because you know him. You See, know listen him. to me. This is the pursuit of God that people are missing. They think the pursuit of God is me doing holiness so that he can look good on me. Or that I can look good to him. That's not it. The pursuit of holiness is literally knowing God. Getting to know him more. And if we get to a point in our lives where we think, I know him pretty well, you're still way off, I promise you. Because God is unknowable, but he still is calling us in, drawing us in closer and closer. So Amen. let's finish up verse 19. Here we go. So are the ways of everyone who gains by violence. It takes away the life of its possessors. Now watch this. There's two things I want you to see here. Number one. There is always a price to be paid, whether good or bad. Always. You will always pay a price. Something that I've told my kids for years. Look, every choice you make has a consequence, be it good or bad. You make wise, good choices, what are you going to have? Good result. If I make bad choices, what am I going to have? Bad consequences. It's just the law of things. That's how things go, right? But what do we keep doing? Let me make this bad decision hoping that I can get a good outcome. It may be good for me for a little while, but it's not going to last. 
you know the definition of insanity, right? Doing the same thing over and over again, expecting a different result? It's not going to happen. Keep making bad choices, what are you going to get? Bad results. So what do you do? Well, you're going to need to beat yourself up for at least four hours. Put yourself in a hole, maybe, you know, throw some dirt on top. No, just, duh. See how easy that is? Ooh. It's not about you getting down in your, your face and, and scraping it across the floor so when you come up, you got blood everywhere. It's about you saying, gosh, what am I doing? This isn't who I am. It, listen, repentance literally is that simple. Because God doesn't want you sticking around in, in the muck and the mire of being sorry for yourself. Wow. Oh, God, forgive me. All right, you're forgiven. Let's go. But God, forgive me. I, I, I said you're forgiven. Come on, let's go. Oh, God, please. See how redundant that seems? But it's real. It, it is real. It really is real. And what, what, who's keeping us down there? We are. We are. We are. The devil, we are. Actually, it's the devil. And the enemy is literally telling you, oh, no. No, 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 no. You're yes. not done being, being, you did this really, really bad. No, he's not telling the truth. Oh, I know. You have to. Now, listen. But if I know my identity in Christ, I know Amen. that's not who I am. Amen. One mistake does not identify me as a mistake for the rest of my life. We learned that on Sunday. Amen. So understand what we're seeing here. Number one, there's always a price to be paid. Number two, if you take, it will be taken from you. Watch this. If you take, it will be taken from you. Remember the, the law? Whatever a man sows, he will reap. If a man sows greediness, what is he going to reap? And how is that going to come in the form of? You know what's going to happen? What he has will be taken away from him. And what is he going to want to do? I need more. So now I go back to greediness. I need more. So I'll sow greediness. And what do you get in return? Somebody's stealing from you. And somebody takes from you. Wow. See, what does that come in the form of? Bills. Things that you don't expect to happen. He's like, well, I've got to do this in order to overcome this. Ah, that's your mistake right there. Allow God to take care of it. Father, you know the issues of my family. You know the issues of my life. I have given you complete and total control over my life, my finances, my family, everything. You have everything. Do what it is that you need me to do. Okay, Gerald, this is what I need you to do. I need you to stop doing this thing. <sighs> yes, sir, because that's for my benefit. I'm going to do it. See, that's where wisdom starts shining through the believer. When they hear God say, okay, this is what we need to do, and you say, okay. Because it's not mine anyway. See, there's the... Miss Roxanne says it all the time. It's not yours anyway. God gave it to you to steward. He didn't give it to you to hold on to. But if you want to hold on to it, he's literally going to take it away from you and give it to somebody else. That's a good analogy. I love that analogy. Say it again. You can't have more if your hands are closed. You can't put anything in a closed hand. If you want more, you've got to open your hand to receive more. I just wanted to hear you say it. So let me... <laughs> there is a specific kind of... And just hang with me here, please. There's a specific kind of monkey that they like to catch. I believe it's in Africa. Okay? How do they catch this... What? Is it a baboon? They put a shiny object inside of a box. The, the baboon puts his hand inside of the box, grabs onto the shiny thing, but he refuses to let go. And when he refuses to let go, he's literally his own trap. And he gets caught. Because he refused. Now, if the baboon would just say, eh, whatever, and pull his hand out, he, but they don't. It's in their nature to hold on to that. That's the exact kind of thing that the enemy wants to do with you. They do. And now here's the thing. When God gives you something, he never gives you anything to hold on to for yourself. Ever. Oh, thank you. Oh, listen. <coughs> what he gives you, he gives you to give away. And then what happens, see, this is the crazy thing about God. When you start giving away and parting with it, he literally gives it back to you. You want to know how I know? There was a big red shed out there. That big red shed had plans. We were going to do some cool things with that big red shed out there. But they sold off the property with the shed on it. 
we were like, well, maybe we should move the wind. You know what? It's the Lord's. He, he's given us the land. We're just gonna we're just gonna let it go. God, and I remember hearing somebody say, God will provide somehow, some way. And we're like, okay. So then I'm just gonna throw her name out there. Miss Stephanie has just bought a, she's just got a brand new house. In the now she's got one of those nice sheds in her backyard because the house that she lives in right now. The house that she lives in doesn't have enough space to keep the stuff that she has in her shed. So she had to buy the shed, right? So now she's moving to this new place. There's this huge garage in her backyard. Guess what? She doesn't need the shed anymore. She wants to donate it to the church so we can use it for it. Amen. Amen. See, once you give it away, God says, finally, I can give you, I'll give you a shed. Now watch this. <laughs> have you looked inside? Some of you have been inside that shed. It's in pretty rough shape. Not the one that God No, gives. it's very nice. Kind of nice. Kind of nice. See, God, you nice. said you bet. See, <laughs> you give away what He's giving you. Never lose or more. Now watch this. What if we take this shed and say it's mine? Uh -uh. Guess what's going to keep take it away? So understand anything that God uses, and, and I, I know a lot of a lot of preachers and teachers like to use money in this analogy, and you can use that as an analogy too. But really, start to think outside of money. Okay, think about your time. Give your time away. Give your phone calls away, right? When somebody calls, answer the phone. Okay? <laughs> I struggle with that sometimes, but I'm getting better. I'm getting better. So, in all kinds of things in your life, when God gives you something. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> huh? You knew I was ignoring your phone calls? Because I don't want to talk to you. I mean, no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> I never get darling. Yet, not going to do me anyway. We all have one. <laughs> all right, so now, so now watch. The very first instruction is what? If you were to take this and just wrap it up into just one thing, pay attention to what your enemy's doing because he's out to trip you up. How do you do that? Stay on the narrow way. Listen to the Word of God. Remain in the Word of God. But more than anything, understand your identity in Christ. I'm telling you, this thing just keeps coming back around and around and around and around and around. And it connects to everything that God is doing, not only in my life, but in yours, but in Lighthouse Church as a whole. Amen. When we understand our identity in Christ, we are a powerful people. Yes. It's not that we are powerful. We are now able to be powerful because he's now working through us. Because we understand who we are. I'm not going to allow the enemy to tell me somebody that I'm not. Amen. He wants to tell me about my past. I don't know what you're talking about. Past is past. P-A-S-S-E-D. -E. Gone. Overdone. Questions about this section of Scripture? All right, let's pray. Father, thank you for this lesson, for this time that we get to spend together, for your encouragement, your challenge to us, Father. This is not a, a harsh word of condemnation to, to beat us over the head. This is, a, this is a call, a challenge for us to grow in the Word of God Amen. and to grow in you, to draw closer to you, because that's really what this is about. It's not about keeping the rules and not keeping the rules and doing this and not doing It's literally understanding that we are yours, that you love us the way that we are. In Christ Jesus, when you see us, you see us complete. You see us holy, blameless, beyond reproach. And God, thank you so much for that truth. That's who we are. We're not the failure. We're not the issue. We're not the problem. We're not the thing that we've done wrong. All we have to do is duck and move on. I thank you, Father, for that. Thank you for the hearts that are here and that will watch this message. Pray that you would bless them, Father. And it's in Jesus Christ's glorious name that I pray. And all of God's children said, Amen. 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 Amen.
30, 39. Yes, you're right. Yeah, we got married. We got married 39 years ago. Yes.